Okay, well, we've got uh, the top of the hour here. Good afternoon and good morning, wherever you are. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's session. My name is Chris Kuchak, and I manage the National Health Expenditures Program here at the Canadian Institute for Health Information. I'm coming to you from Ottawa, which is the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. And Kaihai would like to collectively acknowledge the lands we all occupy, whether treaty or unsurrendered. We're thrilled to have over 200 people registered for today's event, and we will be recording it and making it available on our website and YouTube. So it seems like policymakers are running two races these days. One is a sprint to provide emergency response to deal with the pandemic. The other is a marathon dealing with issues that existed long before the pandemic and will exist long after. Think of things like spending and fiscal position, population aging, health workforce and technology. Well, joining me today is an outstanding panel of experts to discuss. We have Livio Di Matteo, who is professor of economics at Lakehead University. He's a member of the NX advisory group and is a, a regular media commentator on public policy. We have DJ King. He is the executive director of health economics and funding with the government of Alberta. He leads a team that brings evidence and operational uh, to operational and policy decisions at Alberta Health. Kim McGrail is professor at UBC the School of Population and Public Health and the Center for Health Services and Policy Research. You've seen her research on aging and costs and utilization of healthcare services and financing. And Rebecca Young, we have is the Director of Fiscal and Provincial Economics with Scotiabank. Prior to joining Scotiabank, she spent many years at the Federal Department of Finance. Now, we plan to make some time at the end of our session for you, the viewers, to ask some questions. So please feel at any time to drop your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So let's start our discussion today dealing with uh, the challenge of balancing health spending needs and doing it within our budgets. So Livio, turning to you first, historically, we've seen steady increases in health spending. What is your view on the sustainability of this trend? Uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Bonjour à tout le monde. Um, well, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, uh, sustainability is a, a question where the answer, I suppose, an economist would say depends on the, the time perspective you're looking at. I mean, over the long run, the concern over sustainability has been because of the fact that uh, health spending has grown both in per capita terms and as a share of GDP. Uh, if we go back to the 1970s, you're looking at a health expenditure to GDP ratio about 7%. Currently, it's about 13, just under 13. And that's uh, fueled concerns about sustainability, particularly because of the recent surge as a result of the uh, response necessary to deal with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in per capita terms, uh, over the last almost 40, 50 years, uh, real per capita spending, once you just for inflation population, has gone up two and a half times. So over the long term, there has been a concern that there may not be enough resources, uh, given that the, the rise of, of health expenditure seems to be inexorable. You know, in the short term, the pandemic, of course, has probably uh, renewed concerns about sustainability, given there has been this sudden surge. But uh, the concerns about sustainability, in a sense, come and, and go depending on the, the, the growth rate. I mean, in the late 50s, 60s, into the 70s, during the, the start of Medicare, you were looking at growth rates of provincial territorial spending in real per capita terms of well over 10%. These then stabilized at about 3%. Uh, over the course of the 80s. There was actually a decline in the early 90s uh, during the period of the federal uh, fiscal crisis. Then concerns about sustainability uh, reignited given that from about the late 90s to about the Great Recession, 
you were looking at uh, growth in per capita spending of about 4%. Uh, but then it moderated. And up until the pandemic, it was only growing at about uh, 1% a year in real per capita terms. It's in the pandemic that's seen this surge in spending. And even there, you have to examine the surge carefully. Uh, the pandemic response has been responsible for a surge in spending, but if you filter that out, uh, in real per capita terms, there was actually a decline uh, in, in quite a few categories of health spending. So are, should we be concerned about sustainability? On the one hand, uh, the level of sustainability is what society is willing to pay for it. If society is willing to pay for a health expenditure ratio of 13 or 14% or 12%, then that is perfectly reasonable. Um, the other issue when it comes to the fact that well, about two thirds is provincial territorial government is that, well, the system is as sustainable as you want it to be. And if you look at the behavior of provincial governments over time, they, they've always dealt with uh, expenditure uh, concerns when necessary. Uh, the best example of that, of course, was the early 90s. I, I think sustainability is a concern, but the greater concern is value for money in terms of we seem to spend an awful lot on, on health, but the outcomes tend to be a bit more mixed. So we, you know, of the OCD countries, we are what, seven out of 38 in our health expenditure to GDP. We're pretty close to the top 10 or in the top third of real per capita spending. And yet our performance uh, tends to be a bit more mixed on things like infant mortality, some types of um, uh, survival rates for different types of cancers, et cetera. And that's on the, uh, the outcome side. Uh, on the input side, despite the fact that we seem to spend an awful lot of money, um, our physicians uh, per thousand population are, we rank 30th out of 38. Uh, hospital beds were also quite down there as uh, was certainly noted uh, during the pandemic. Uh, MRIs uh, per million, again, we tend to be in the bottom third. So we have this odd situation where we, we seem to spend a lot. Uh, the outcomes are a bit more mixed. It's not that we have a bad healthcare system. We have a very good healthcare system. I mean, it's easy to exaggerate these rankings given that these are all developed countries. And so the actual differences on the outcomes in some respects are actually quite small. But yet there is the question of, uh, can we get uh, a better value for money? And that becomes a concern because in the longer term, if you think about it, um, the healthcare system does have to compete with everybody else. Um, there's a lot of concerns about climate change. Uh, there's concerns about inequality, uh, housing costs. And so these are all issues that uh, in a sense are going to capture the attention of the public, policymakers, politicians. And so I think it's important uh, if you're going to get more resources to demonstrate value for money, uh, given that uh, you will probably have to make more of a case uh, as time goes on. Over to you, Chris. Thanks. Uh, now, DJ, turning to you and thinking about uh, provincial and territorial health spending, uh, before the pandemic, Alberta was on the uh, upper end of the spectrum when it comes to per capita spending. Uh, can you share a little bit about the process uh, that Alberta undertook to address this issue? Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you note, Chris, uh, I think we are still on the higher end of the spectrum. Um, and as Livio noted, Canada is a pretty uh, high spender uh, globally on a per capita basis. And we tend to look, at least my group tends to look, primarily at per capita spending because it, it kind of standardizes across different jurisdictions. Um, so as we just talked about, Alberta continues to be one of the highest per capita spenders in uh, amongst the larger provinces in Canada. And uh, that difference is quite significant actually. If you take a look at the NHEX report, um, we're quite a bit above uh, some of the other larger provinces. And so obviously, you know, looking that we're high among Canada, but we're also high globally, it just it stands to reason that we're, we're, uh, we're obviously at the very high end of the, of the spectrum for healthcare spending. And as Livio noted, um, you know, our health, health outcomes as, a, as Canadians just aren't seeming to kind of align with the amount of dollars we're spending in the space. And that of course mirrors in Alberta. Uh, 
And so uh, even amongst the provinces, our, our outcomes uh, are not significantly different uh, than, our, than our colleagues. And so uh, what we try to do then is, is we try to look at what's driving the cost. And, and when you start to look at that, of course, one of the first things you look at is labor. And labor tends to be about uh, two thirds of the system cost in Alberta. And um, labor is a very interesting area. And anybody who's out there uh, that works in the labor space, I think you'll, you'll agree that there's so many variants and, and so many ways to approach uh, labor analysis. Uh, I'm no expert for sure, um, but my observation is that generally when, when the economy is in an expansionary period, uh, basic economics would say that you know driving up compensation uh, because of, of the extra demand in the economy. And of course, uh, you know, this rising tide would, would impact healthcare as well. And so, uh, but what we find though, especially in the healthcare space is that uh, wages are much stickier on the way down during economic contractions. And that's different than other sectors where you can see uh, significant declines in wages and benefits uh, in those spaces. Uh, the healthcare labor needs just don't ebb and flow quite like the general economy. And uh, that's a bit of a challenge for provinces and, and other jurisdictions um, in order to manage that. Because once the, once the costs are there, you kind of get stuck. And um, the way to do that, and, and Alberta you know, went down this path a few years back, but you start to signal to your stakeholders that uh, the belt needs to be tightened. And we, we heard Livio talk about the 90s, and, and that was a dramatic period of time for those old enough to be part of that uh, in the healthcare space. But uh, essentially the fiscal belt, you know, we, we start to signal that the fiscal belt needs to be tightened and, uh, and started to take some action to do that. And I will say that over the past several years has been able to work with its stakeholders and uh, to, in some respects, tighten that fiscal belt. Uh, overall costs haven't really went down but uh, on a per capita basis, it's definitely flatlined. Uh, and if you, again, looking at the NHEX report, um, you'll see that uh, Alberta's, you know, having some success flatlining the overall growth in healthcare expenditure, uh, while other provinces, uh, for many different reasons, uh, continue to grow their, their, uh, their spending in that space. And so that, that, that difference between us and the other large provinces is starting to reduce a bit. Uh, so, and again, so I'd say from that perspective, Alberta has had the success they were looking for. And uh, we definitely use publications like in, uh, National Health Expenditure to help us monitor where we're at uh, in our comparison with other provinces. Hopefully that answers your question, Chris. Yes, indeed, DJ. Thank you so much. Now, I'm thinking uh, I'm going to turn over to you, Rebecca, uh, thinking of your time at the Department of Finance and uh, the realities of post-pandemic budget deficits. Uh, what are some of the, the challenges that you see of managing budgets while juggling competing demands for funds? And since we have primarily a, a health system planner audience, you know, how can we be aware uh, of these issues when, when putting our budget uh, requests together to finance? Well, I think you capture the essence of what the finance department does with that idea of competition and competition for finite resources. So the finance minister, you know, he or she, she as it is now, is the no minister typically. So, you know, for every dollar available, there are literally tens and tens of um, requests for that limited dollar. So the, that, the finance department has to trade off these competing demands and where should they be allocated. Now the headline numbers that they allocate, so do, we, do they go with a big number or a small number? They try to calibrate that to economic conditions. So when the economy is weak, they'll tend to spend more and when it's uh, stronger, they'll spend less. So there's that, that aspect. And the third issue that they try to do as well is they try to think, where are we gonna enhance growth? And now that's one challenge because they see things like health expenditures as just that, as an expenditure, not as something that is going to strengthen growth. So I would say our economic systems right now aren't great at capturing the value of a healthy workforce or an educated workforce for that matter. So we still see these as expenses and not as growth enhancing. 
So those in a nutshell are a few things that, you know, the finance department and the finance minister are weighing off when they're trying to decide how much and where should they allocate. Now, I would say in the current context, there are some positives and negatives in terms of allocating additional funds to health expenditures. And the first is that right now, what we see is the federal government, it has this willingness or propensity to spend right now coming off the initial effects of the pandemic. So we know they had an, an enormous deficit last year it was about 350 billion. A big chunk of that went to healthcare. And so that's actually given provinces some breathing space because we had these large exceptional transfers to provinces to support uh, the, the pandemic so far. And we know from election promises that there should be more coming for, for provinces owing to some backlogs in things like surgeries and, and, and other procedures. So there is this you know, propensity to spend right now and in part because quite honestly, the pandemic exposed some major gaps in our health, you know, our health systems, also in our long-term care systems and more generally in what we might call the caring economy. So we're in a situation of you know, propensity to spend, you know, we're federal government aware of the gaps in the provinces with a bit more breathing space. Now the downsides are uh, that you know there, there's a sense now is it time to start reining in those expenditures? So I suspect that Ottawa will be looking at you know very carefully now going ahead how much more do they spend? But I would say you know pragmatically looking at recommendations for you know proposals that are being made. Um, one it was mentioned already this idea of value for money. So and and I would take that in a, a step further, not just value for money. Um, not just focusing on inputs or the dollar value that is being sought in a proposal, but really try to shift to outcomes. So what are the, um, and, and even not in terms of, you know, hosp hospital beds or number of procedures, but in terms of, you know, the, the welfare benefits that it provides for the population. Um, and I know that is even getting ahead of where the federal system is often in, in measuring outcomes as opposed to inputs. But I really do think that that's where the, the system needs to go in that proposal that are able to better illustrate, you know, what money buys, um, you know, will 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 be, you know, get get more light of day. Um, a second aspect I think is that, um, you know, focusing on gaps in the system. So where are additional or incremental dollars going to help close some of the gaps that were identified over the last twenty months? And I guess my final point would be. Remember that Ottawa is looking at, you know, at the system as a system of many systems across the country in, in healthcare. And so also look at, way, you know, ideas, proposals that have potential for economy of scale. So the request might be just for one specific geographical area or one specific discipline. But, you know, sitting in Ottawa, the perch in Ottawa, generally they're looking for ideas that might, you know, if successful, demonstrate a scale for other regions that would bring benefits. So those are just a few practical considerations I would flag in, in the context of what we've lived through in the last 20 months. Well, that's great. Thank you, Rebecca. Now, I just want to shift gears and talk about population aging. This is a topic uh, that we've been talking about for years. It's, it's a steady cost driver that uh, existed long before the pandemic will continue afterwards. Kim, turning to you, uh, the pandemic highlighted issues related to seniors care. How do you think health system planners should tackle this issue, especially with regards to finding the appropriate balance between long-term residential care and home care? Thanks, Chris, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, and I just start by saying I really appreciate the way that you framed the question because while the focus of the pandemic was there and has been on long-term care, we do really need to consider the whole uh, continuum of care, including home-based care, other community services, and various forms of congregate housing, as well as long-term care. So maybe the, the first um, point I'll make, and perhaps this is the most important piece, is that um, this part of our health system really does need more investment, more funding. And this doesn't mean, so I, this is perhaps one of the gaps that um, Rebecca was pointing to. This, this, and this doesn't mean that we need overall health expenditures to go up, um, but we at least, least need to consider some reallocation, perhaps through some efficiencies in other parts of the system. If we can agree on that, the next um, thing to consider is how that funding could best be used. 
So one way to approach this would be by reaffirming or updating the values that inform our health systems and, and particularly those that relate to this sector, which really does start to cross over between healthcare and social services. And some of the questions we might wanna ask is what do we think should be publicly funded? Um, how does that work with other sorts of, of funding options and who are the services for and um, where should they be provided? Those, and I'm sure there's many, many other questions as well, but this, this really does relate to um, some, I would say normative decisions that need to be made or values-based decisions that we need to make. And ideally we would make those with the public. So without question, I think we need to look beyond the current models that we have in place in, in this sector of the health system. For example, a lot of the existing long-term care infrastructure is old. It's often um, uses shared rooms and is based on an institutionalization model. So the same model is used for people who have really, really different needs as well. So that's something that we might need to rethink, or I, I would suggest we do need to rethink. So for example, um, people with significant physical impairments or complex underlying health conditions have the same institutional model in front of them for long-term care as do people with significant dementia, um, but who otherwise may be well. It's not clear at all that those people need the same supports or the same services or would even necessarily do well um, in spaces with, that, are, um, uh, that are shared overall. So perhaps more importantly, the um, preference for individuals and families is for people to remain in the community as long as they possibly can. And this means needing different forms of care, whether that's home-based services or different kinds of congregate living. So, and I can put a point on what's happening in this sector using the example of, of British Columbia and acknowledging that there are big variations across provinces and territories and the formation and policies in this particular part of the healthcare system. But in BC, the population of older adults uh, about doubled between 2001 and 2021, so over the past 20 years. And the doubling was from about 500,000 people over the age of 65 to now about a million people in that age group. And meanwhile, the number of long-term get uh, long sorry long-term long care beds that are available increased by about 3,000 from 25,000 to 28,000. So if you do the math, this means that we have a 60% lower supply of publicly funded long-term care beds than we did 20 years ago. Now, some of that, a small bit of it might be compensated by other forms of care, but overall, I think we're doing some cost shifting. Um, but this has been done implicitly rather than based on, as I said earlier, discussions about values and what we really want out of this part of the system. So in the context of COVID and the focus on long-term care, this means that they have a, I would argue, um, pretty invisible effect on um, pretty frail people who were left in the community and lost a lot of services and social connections um, because of the lockdowns and so on. So ultimately this is really about transforming a system to be patient and family-centered and or person and family centered and really with an objective, I hope that we have of delivering health and social care that will support better health. Back to you, Chris. All right, thank you. And actually on your last point, I'd like to, to just double back to Rebecca for a moment. And can you comment on, on Kim's uh, point about uh, the objective is to, to deliver better health and health care and what other factors uh, in the broader Canadian economy uh, should we consider? I think uh, Kim makes an excellent point. Uh, well, many excellent points, but in particular about the need for a dialogue and that some of these decisions are uh, value decisions or normative decisions that we as a society need to have. And so, you know, one way of looking at it is that we're, we're all taxpayers in the system and we're all patients in the system. So we have a, a social contract with our government that in exchange for our tax dollars, we have a certain expectation for services in our healthcare or education systems. And so we need to have that kind of dialogue of what do we expect for the tax dollars that we are, are spending. And when we look at where some of the changes might be going, both in terms of you know, the, the pressures on our, our systems, our healthcare systems, as well as the pressures on the tax base, I think that really you know, points to a need for this type of dialogue. And so, first of all, if we look at aging demographics in part, I would say 
broad based across the country, um, but particularly acute in, in some areas, including out east where I am right now, is that, you know, that will have an increasing uh, cost pressure for governments um, with aging populations. And at the same time, aging populations, as they drop out of the workforce, they are paying less taxes, so fewer tax dollars to provide uh, uh, arguably a higher level of service. So, but, you know, fortunately, we do have growing population right now in Canada. A big part of that is immigration. And so we're bringing in younger new Canadians, uh, providing higher taxes, but they're also putting more pressure on the systems as well. So again, just reinforcing that we need to have that discussion because there are a lot of these structural changes going on that are, you know, putting cost pressures up and could put put the tax um, base under pressure if we don't, you know, decide what is it that we want for our system and, uh, you know, and what sorts of outcomes do we want. Uh, you know, and just picking up on a second point that, uh, that Kim uh, made, which is, you know, there really isn't any panacea or cookie cutter approach. And I like the idea of that person centered or patient centric uh, driven approach and that it'll, you know, it'll be a variety of, uh, of, of solutions, um, not just, um, you know, depending on your geography or your household, but even at the stage of, of life that an individual might find themselves in is that one or a different solution uh, might, might be appropriate. So how do you design a national system that allows for a multi of different solutions over time um, and, and at the same time and still maintain proper oversight, uh, effective funding and a focus on outcomes. So I think, you know, again, just reinforcing that, you know, it's, it's really timely that uh, we have more of these discussions. Yeah, and I think your point, Rebecca, we're, we're all patients and we're all taxpayers. I think that's a good reminder for uh, certainly uh, for me anyway. Uh, and a reminder to you in the audience, you can drop your uh, questions. Uh, we'll have time at the end for viewer questions, so you can drop those in the Q&A. So I want to shift uh, gears to go back to a, a conversation we touched on at the beginning about the caring sector of the economy. And, you know, when we think of healthcare services, they're provided by people or labor. Uh, Livio, I want to bring you back into the conversation. The health workforce has been a key cost driver of Canada's health system. What are some of the trends uh, health system planners should be considering? Uh, that's a very good question, uh, Chris. Um, in the end, there appears to be shortages uh, of healthcare professionals, uh, whether it's physicians or nurses or PSWs. Uh, this was something that was evident uh, before the pandemic, uh, and it's certainly been intensified uh, during the pandemic. But it's a bit of a paradox because on the one hand, we, we spend a lot on health and yet there seems to be continual shortages and waiting lists, et cetera. And, and so, I mean, how do you wrap your head around that? And, and I think, you know, if I had to sort of throw something out just at the, off the top of my head, uh, I would say that we seem to have a, a healthcare system that um, essentially has fewer healthcare professionals per capita compared to a lot of other systems, uh, we pay them a lot and then we work them really hard. I, I mean, on the one hand, our physician numbers or our hospital bed numbers uh, are much lower than uh, other countries. Uh, on the other hand, they're run very intensively. I mean, our physician consultations per capita are, are sort of near the upper end. And so that in a perverse sort of way might be contributing uh, to shortages uh, because when you sort of run your system like that, um, there could be a lot of burnout amongst uh, staff and physicians, uh, et cetera. And so that maybe that's part of the problem. So that's something to uh, consider. Um, then the other issue is uh, just, an, again, along this line of, of shortages, I, I mean, the number of physicians per 100,000 in Canada stayed relatively flat from about the 1980s up until the late 90s, early 2000s. But since then, it's actually grown. We probably uh, increased the per capita number of physicians by about 25%. And yet at the same time, um, we have uh, in the early 2000s, about 14 to 15% of Canadians without a family physician. And today that number really hasn't changed much, even though we've augmented the stock. So there, there's been changes in, in the workforce in that we've added more physicians but they are taking on fewer fewer patients. Uh, they want more of a, a work-life balance. Uh, 
So how do you accommodate that um, with the remuneration necessary to attract people into the sector, whether it's nurses or PSWs or physicians? I mean, there, there, there's an awful lot going on there and trying to sort that out. Uh, in the end, uh, the demographics of uh, all these professions are, are aging. And so just as the population is aging, so is your, your healthcare resources, your healthcare workforce. So how do you plan for replacement and entry? Do you uh, increase uh, immigration of uh, foreign professionals into our system? Do you boost our training? You know, how do you plan? Uh, planning is important, but the other thing you have to keep in mind when planning is you have to be careful, much like you know, generals are sometimes always fighting the last war. You have to be careful when you're planning that you're not you know, planning for the, the last pandemic or the last healthcare crisis. I, I mean, take the long-term care sector, for example. Um, there's a, a lot of plans now being made for investment in new beds in long-term care, new resources going into long-term care. And I think you have to think about that carefully because uh, during the course of the pandemic, anyone with family or relatives uh, in long-term care sort of glimpsed what happened. And well, I, I think a lot of us just don't, aren't planning to go there one way or another. I mean, there's ways to be creative, trust me. And so, um, you know, you might be over-investing. Think of what happened in education in the 60s and 70s when they thought the baby boom would go on forever and they sort of overbuilt capacity in schools. And then in the 90s and the 2000s are years of school closures. Um, you don't want to repeat that kind of mistake. Uh, maybe you do want to focus more on, you know, home care options, uh, more flexible options that allow people to stay uh, in their homes longer. And of course, that's going to affect um, the type of staff you're going to hire, the type of planning that you might want to do. So, I, I mean, there, there, there is a lot going on there. And uh, planning is important to, to augment the human resources. Um, but I, I don't think there's going to be uh, any type of uh, panacea or, or, as has already been noted, or one size fits all so solution to how we deal even with the uh, human resource issues here. So DJ, going back to you, because uh, we heard from you talk about labor uh, at the start of the uh, event today. Uh, can you shed some light on how some of the challenges uh, are playing out in Alberta and what are the issues that you're considering? Yeah, you bet. Uh, so as Livio just mentioned, many different issues around the labor space. Um, one, one thing I'd like to focus on is, is um, something I mentioned before was, it was the ability to claw back benefits and incentives once they're in place. Um, because I think that fits directly with what Livia was trying to explain uh, there. Yeah, early in the COVID crisis, uh, one of the things that Alberta determined was, and across the country, quite frankly, uh, that there, there was a problem in some of our long-term care spaces, our continuing care spaces, uh, with what uh, I think Ontario calls PSWs. In Alberta, we call them healthcare aides. And, and, but they're essentially at the lower end of the wage continuum. And uh, funnily enough, they're at the front line of COVID because they're the ones that do a lot of the, the work with uh, direct work with clients. Um, other, other providers do that as well, but they get the HCAs in our case, get the lion's share of that work. And it really, obviously with the pandemic in the middle of their, their work environment, it increased their exposure to COVID for sure. And uh, what we were hearing rumors of is people were really considering whether or not they should continue to work in the space because of their own personal uh, perspective on exposure to COVID and things of that nature. Um, so early on in the pandemic, Alberta provided a, a $2 top up to these workers uh, in facility-based continuing care. And it really was deemed to be required to, to incent folks to continue to work in the space. Uh, even during a pandemic. And, uh, but it, during the communication and, and what we got approval for from a budget perspective really was a temporary measure during the pandemic, which as we all know is continuing to go on and uh, new variants are coming out uh, regularly. But what it showed though, is that um, uh, incentives or remuneration or some type of, of consideration of the work environment needs to happen. And so provinces are uh, 
uh, trying and attempting to do that uh, to incent folks to to be involved and continue to be involved in in healthcare because healthcare is can be a uh, a uh, a difficult place to work depending on the environment and so uh, uh, but on the on the cost side on the on the expense side it uh, it is interesting in that as I talked about before these type of things are a bit sticky so when we 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 identify the incentive to both the operators as well as, as staff, uh, we were very clear in Alberta that this was only during the pandemic and that the $2 incentive would, would uh, go away when that, when that pandemic is, is, uh, is over. Not sure when that will be or who's gonna make that call, but nonetheless, um, I think the stars are starting to align against clawing back that, in, that, that incentive uh, and specifically, as, as was mentioned by several of our speakers, we're starting to see general labor shortages in, in uh, healthcare, and especially staff at the lower end of the pay spectrum. Uh, they're finding other opportunities and choosing to go that route, or they're just not entering the system. As well as we're all hearing about rampant inflation, again, due to the pandemic, um, but, uh, but the two of those together, really start to set a framework where it will be difficult for government to, to claw all or some of, of that incentive back. Well, and so take that example though, and take it out to the broader response for the pandemic where Alberta's invested hundreds of millions of dollars um, into the response for the temp pandemic, essentially going into a fairly inelastic labor supply. So basic econ economy, Economics, sorry, <laughs> um, but uh, you know you, you're you're throwing a bunch of dollars into a system for a particular need, and your labor supply is fairly inelastic, and uh, and, and generally uh, that drives up uh, wages and incentives in the system. So it will be very interesting. The story is yet to be told of how successful governments will be in removing these response dollars. Uh, once the pandemic uh, cycles down or 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 ends altogether, which is I think the hope of most of us, um, so the continuing challenge will be in our in our healthcare space is to really attract uh, retain folks, which is what the two dollar incentive was about, and attracting youth into the sector, um, and so that's a function of uh, supply demand dollars uh, and culture quite frankly uh, so it will be uh, it's it's a story that's evolving before us chris thanks uh, so what i want to do now is look ahead to the future and future opportunities we saw during the pandemic an uptake in the use of technology and specifically uh, as an example virtual care Kim, uh, considering all we've discussed today and uh, the move towards virtual care during the pandemic, uh, how can we continue to evolve in the future? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question and a, an interesting and an important challenge. And I, I would say um, that in the case of uh, primary care, the very quick uh, and really complete switch during the first part of the, the lockdown of the pandemic um, to virtual care was both compelling and depressing. So it was compelling because it shows that where there's a uh, will, things can happen quite quickly. Um, I found it a bit depressing because it really shouldn't take a pandemic to make these kinds of changes of, within the health system. And, and clearly the virtual space is one of those that we had the capability of, of expanding those services um, far more than we had prior um, to that. So, and again, I think this is really about transforming the system to be person-centered. Um, virtual care in its, in its widest sense is the way I'm, I'm meaning it. So this is about um, cases where you, you might have a, a, a nurse or some other kind of health care provider in a, a room that's set up with technology in a rural location and through that uh, to be able to speak to a specialist um, in, a, in a different location which is really about um, extend, extending the reach of specialty services, but also it really means that patients and families don't have to travel for everything that they might need a specialist for. So that's on, on one side of things. And then of course the primary care side where 
And the virtual care um, setting allows patients to receive care that doesn't require hands-on or in-person contact with the provider. It might be for a prescription refill or a, a quick question. And, and maybe in some cases they would be triaged and asked to come in, but in other cases, again, you save, save time and travel costs and daycare costs and missing work and all of those other things if, if you can provide that, that virtual care. Without question, um, virtual care can't replace in-person care. I don't think anybody is driving toward that. On the other hand, it would also seem unreasonable at this point to go back to the old normal. So if virtual care is here to stay, then we need the right policies and right technology and technological implementation to support its use. So on the policy side, I think one of the major things is just to acknowledge and support the idea that this is another legitimate mode of providing care for your patient. And it, the acknowledgement of course means that, that, that there would be um, reimbursement for those services in a fee-for-service setting and or um, allowance for that time that it takes in a, in a non-fee-for-service setting. So, and, and again, it's not an either or, we need to have both um, in-person, virtual, other kinds of interactions um, between providers and, and the public. And ideally what we're, we're gonna frame this around is providing, uh, ensuring that we provide the right care in the right place at the right time with vir virtual just being another potential right place. So the, the policy environment needs to support those kinds of things, appropriateness of care and, and that sort of thing. On the technology side, it really is pretty clear from the existing research that the way you implement the, these virtual technologies into the system really matters for their uptake and use. Um, so for example, in a primary care setting, it's really important to integrate um, the virtual care options into an EMR so that when you're providing virtual care, it's an ease of access, it's not yet another system, any kind of documentation or conversations can be easily placed in the EMR, that there's some sort of support or training um, for how to do the kind of concierge services around using um, virtual platforms and so on. So those, those kinds of things, again, are, they're available to us, but we need to make sure that the, the policy environment and technology environment supports, as I said, um, something that I hope is here to stay as a permanent part of the healthcare uh, delivery model. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Kim. Um, you know, I'm gonna go back to you, Rebecca. Uh, you know, Kim Pate's actually a, a, a very promising future, uh, you know, in, in terms of the uh, future of, of healthcare. You know, what should planners be thinking about for funding this future? Well, I guess um, you, I, I totally agree. We we sort of fast forwarded, you know, a couple of decades in what we saw in, in the delivery of virtual healthcare over the pandemic. And again, it, you know, I would echo Kim's point that it, you know, was somewhat disappointing that it took a pandemic, but we, you know, how do we now capitalize on what we've learned um, as a result? And how do we make sure that, you know, the best practices bubble up and um, the stuff that didn't work out so well um, gets left behind? I would note in the near term, we still don't know what the final price tags will be on healthcare over the course of the pandemic. So I mentioned that provinces, um, you know, many provinces so far that have, you know, tallied their deficit spending over last year, including in healthcare savings. So part of it is that the federal government provided offsets, but part of it was that, you know, some procedures were just delayed or some consultations that had to take place in person. There are good chunks of last year that they weren't happening. And so how much of the underspend last year is a backlog of stuff that couldn't be done virtually and is, you know, pushed forward and, in, in, you know, looking ahead. So I would say we're not out of the woods yet uh, to be able to say that we've caught up with demand for healthcare uh, yet as a result of the pandemic and what will be the cost uh, structures. So has our pricing reflected this change? And so what might've been at one point, uh, you know, a 30 minute consultation in person now um, can often be done in a five or 10 minute phone consultation. So I would say that, you know, something to watch is, is where, you know, where does, you know, what, 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 what are the final price tags coming in over the next year or two? But when we look beyond the next year or two, I think we, you know, we may and we should capitalize again on, you know, this idea of disruptive technology and bending that cost curve of the delivery of healthcare and better outcomes for less input. 
And again, you know, it, it's, it's really an unprecedented moment at, that we had a live experiment of, of, of trying virtual healthcare. So as we look ahead and we see the math doesn't add up in terms of burgeoning costs and, and uh, you know, a shrinking taxpayer base, um, we, you know, we may have, you know, a lot of you know, ideas ripe for the picking when we, when we look at back at what, what, we, what we've learned over the course of the pandemic. So I really think that it is an area that, you know, that, you know, particularly going forward in proposals that are pitching to the government for funding should be looking at how their ideas really capitalize on that learning. And so how can we deliver a better system uh, with fewer inputs and leveraging the, the virtual learnings that we have uh, acquired over the past 20 months? So now's the time uh, where we will turn to the viewer questions. And uh, I think I'm gonna start uh, this first one going back to Livio and, and then DJ, if you wanna chime in. Uh, one of our viewers asks that, you know, given the scarce nature of health human resources and the portability of their skills and credentials within Canada, you know, is there uh, the potential that, you know, we might be driving up wages or labor costs through competition across provinces or even within a province, uh, competition for that scarce labor uh, across facilities? Uh, I'll start with you, Livio, and, and, and DJ, you can add if you have anything else to add. Well, that's a very good question. And it's, in the end, really a, a question about federalism, if you want to think of that. Um, you know, federalism is Canada's greatest strength and its greatest weakness at the same time. On the one hand, having provin provincial health systems competing uh, and innovating and coming up with new ideas that can then be shared, I, I think, is, is really good. On the other hand, sometimes there are benefits to better coordination, which is not always apparent uh, when you have competing systems. Now, in the case of uh, scarcity of labor and resources, the most constructive solution is to have the provinces cooperate to boost supply, whether it's working together on immigration or on training opportunities, on recruitment. Um, trying to restrict uh, competition and in the end uh, will involve uh, affecting the mobility of professionals. And I think in the short run, you might get some benefits out of that. But in the long run, what you're doing is creating an incentive for highly trained professionals uh, to take advantage of international opportunities. So, I mean, if the provinces can work together on planning initiatives to boost supply, and, you know, don't ask me how to do that. I've never run a health ministry. However, if there must be some way of working together on that, I think that would be for the best. But you do have to be careful there. You don't want to restrict opportunities of healthcare professionals in such a way that they might be tempted to leave. Yeah, uh, DJ, uh, you, you run a health ministry uh, <laughs> working in policy. Uh, anything else to add to that? Uh, well, I agree absolutely that supply is probably a, a large part of the challenge. And uh, we absolutely do compete both within province and across provinces, not just uh, for supply of, of a limited resource. Uh, and it's not just about dollars, it's also about uh, in working environment. So I'd, I'd go back to an example we had uh, in the mid 90s, where we were losing a bunch of uh, physicians at that, that point in time to other jurisdictions. Funnily enough, uh, a large number of them went to BC. And uh, it wasn't for more dollars, because we were still paying more at the, at the time. But it was uh, for quality of life and other other things that we haven't really got our finger on yet. But uh, those are part of the supply equation that I think we also need to look at. So uh, we should look broadly about you know what attracts folks to specific industries and uh, what our supply demand equation looks like and what we really need for from a supply perspective. Okay, and we have time for one more viewer question. Maybe Kim, I'm going to look to you because you touched on primary health care in your discussion. And one of the questions comes in uh, looking at uh, filling gaps uh, in the future uh, in, uh, with disciplines, uh, you know, more broadly thinking physician assistants and community social workers and, and, uh, and others. And I guess that touches on scopes of practice and, 
maybe uh, can you speak to that in terms of filling major gaps in the system? Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a really interesting question about how to respond to some, um, this is both about um, community need, but also about um, health human resource availability. Um, and there are really interesting things going on. I'm thinking about Nova Scotia, for example, where I know that there have been some um, experiments and expansion of um, community paramedic, that kind of model where um, there's certain, they're trained to actually provide something that looks pretty close to primary care, or at least triaging and often leaving people in place rather than necessarily um, just thinking that as a paramedic, what you have to do is go pick people up and transport them someplace else. So there's, I, I think there is a lot of, of scope um, for those um, kinds of services and, and changes in the scope of practice and really trying to think of it from a, a patient-centered lens of how do these different um, scopes of practice interact when more we're trying to provide more care outside of institutional settings, whether we're talking about hospitals and getting people out of hospitals earlier or avoiding hospitalization altogether or um, retaining people in community rather than admitting to long-term care facilities. Um, so there is a lot of, of opportunity there. I would say at the same time that um, you know the, the health economist um, Bob Evans used to talk about the healthcare feast. And this is, you know, it kind of references the, the number of different kinds of providers and the pay scales of providers that are operating in the healthcare system. So we, we, we really do have to be planning carefully about how we introduce new things and, and how, what that means for the supply and need for other um, kinds of um, health human resources capabilities as well. Yeah, I think uh, at this point, uh, I, I, uh, I would like to um, probably take time for a round table with, uh, with all uh, of our panelists uh, before we close off. And so maybe we can all come on screen and, and maybe uh, if we can close out our session uh, and, and basically asking each of you going around the table to share your final takeaways to our audience of, uh, of policy folks today. Maybe uh, Livio, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, any final takeaways for our audience? Well, uh, as much as I consider economics one of the helping professions, uh, it's really difficult uh, to provide a all-encompassing takeaway aside from some of the effect that, well, there's an awful lot going on. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainties, a lot of change and uh, to, to a large extent, uh, I think uh, decision makers, um, it's much like a card game. You are going to have to play the hand that you're dealt as best as you can. And so in the end, uh, health expenditure decisions and resource allocations are going to have to be made. I mean, the decision is going to have to be made. You're gonna to have to do it based on the best available information that you can pull together. and. If the decisions turn out to be correct, I suppose so much the better. I mean, that's probably not the most reassuring uh, takeaway, but um, I, I don't think there's a, an easy answer to a lot of what's going on. Um, but you don't give up. I mean, like I said, you play the hand that you're dealt as best that you can. Great, Rebecca, maybe I'll turn to you next. Uh, any final final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've learned a lot on the panel myself. And, you know, one thing I think from, you know, my takeaway from an economic perspective is that perhaps our models for economics don't capture everything they need to. Um, for example, they don't capture the value of a healthy society, and hence we don't value proactive measures. So we're always waiting till the patient is sick, until the patient, you know, is no longer able to live alone. Like we're always waiting till it's too late in a way. How do you actually create a system that, that you know, that that values that that healthcare or that, you know, the proactive approach? Um, also, how do you have a system that's flexible to innovate? So how do you have like lots of, you know, hundreds and thousands of little ideas sparking, um, you know, Kim mentioned many, many of us mentioned uh, specific examples. How do you foster those ideas and have the best ones surface to the top and, uh, and foster them so that they can spread to other communities and that we learn from ones that there's a tolerance for um, for ideas that are tried and we learn from them, they don't necessarily succeed, but we shouldn't, you know, banish or punish failures, we should actually learn from them. So how do we create that system of, uh, of innovation 
And the other, uh, you know, the final point would again be back to economics and, you know, are we correctly valuing the caring economy? And so it was mentioned labor shortages and, you know, particularly frontline workers in the health system and, you know, support workers and in and, and long term care homes is that, you know, are we reflecting what we truly value in what they do in the, you know, in the wages that they are paid? So just a couple of thoughts that, you know, sparked in my mind as we were discussing today. BJ, I'll turn to you next. Uh, final takeaways. Sure. Um, I think we've heard some really good thoughts today about both the opportunities and some of the challenges in the healthcare space. Um, we, you know, I want to leave a positive note because I do think we have really great people in the healthcare space that are monitoring and analyzing the system on an ongoing basis. And, and I, I suspect that there are many of those folks watching today that, that are in that space where they're giving evidence uh, to decision makers or they're part of small businesses or the consultants or uh, in the private space. So I guess, you know, kind of my, my parting thought is, you know, let's ensure that we're giving great evidence and, and, and giving great innovative ideas to decision makers so we can maximize the outcomes that we're getting from our uh, from the dollars that we're spending. And we've heard that over and over again today. For sure. And Kim, you get the last word, please, uh, your final takeaways. Yeah, thanks for all of this. And I will start by saying I, I really agree with uh, what my um, co-panelists have said. So I'll just highlight a couple other things. So, and just really picking up on something Livio said, I think I think we can expect that change is going to be constant. So we really have to figure out how the the system can be a learning health system so that we're, um, so we we take this more as a smooth kind of change process whether, rather than this kind of stair step, all of a sudden things are wildly different um, um, at one time. I, I think that another theme that came out of the discussion today that is there isn't one size fits all. And there really is some benefit and variation, whether that's across regions or across people, as long as we can learn from it. And that goes back to this idea of being a learning health system. And then the other is that um, I, I agree with this, uh, you know, we need really good decision-making and we need great evidence to inform decision-making. And I would just add, I think we need inclusive decision-making. I think we really need a lot of different viewpoints and stakeholders involved because there are different perspectives and ways of thinking about problems and solutions. And um, if we want to address the issues that Christy you raised at the beginning, all these issues of equity and access and outcomes that um, have been with us prior to the pandemic, then we're going to need that inclusive approach, approach coming out of the pandemic and beyond. So I think with that, uh, I'm going to wrap things up. I think we're going to put up a, a, a poll. Uh, on your screen for viewers to fill out. And we just wanna get your feedback on uh, some of the information that you'll be using. Uh, with that, uh, I wanna thank our panel for their outstanding insights. I wanna thank you, the viewers. Uh, we didn't get to all your questions, uh, but I wanna thank you for your presence here today. Uh, recording of this event will be made available in the next few days and uh, please circulate it uh, amongst your colleagues who, who weren't able uh, to make it today. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about this topic and, and others, you can check out Kai High's new podcast available on Spotify, Apple, and Google. Um, there's an evaluation form in the chat. Uh, uh, please give us your feedback to help us make these events better. And uh, if you have more questions, you can always reach me at, uh, at our uh, email address, nhex at kaihai.ca. That's N-H-E-X at cihi.ca. I want to thank you all again. Uh, please keep in touch and uh, have a, a great rest of your day. Thank you.